Hello and welcome to another episode of Talk It Out. This is Sayeda Sami Ali. I am the Deputy HOC at International Center of Excellence, Karachi Campus. And today we have our esteemed guest from Staffordshire University, Babs. And over to Babs. Hi, hello. Um, hopefully you've watched the previous podcast, but my name is Bab and Gillian Diweni. I'm the Regional Manager at Staffordshire University, and I look after students who join the institution from Pakistan. Okay, thank you so much for being on the show again, uh, Babs. How was your experience so far? It's the second time you're coming to Karachi? Yes, my experience has been so great. I'm happy to be in Karachi at this time of year because it's a lot cooler and not as hot as before. And it's good to also see ice develop. Um, it's changed a lot since I was last here as well. Hey, that's great to know. So I've heard you have been to many different places to have food. But as you know, we are foodie people. So what type of food have you tried so far? Oh, so I've been trying a lot of the local cuisine, even though I'm still not good with spicy food. But I've also tried to understand a bit more of like your international cuisine as well. So students will be able to adapt well to the UK. They've got everything they have here over there as well. Have you tried Pakistani cuisine in the UK before? No, I haven't. One day. <laughs> it's my next thing to do. So that's what I'll be trying to do when Since I get back Since you have a relationship with us now, so definitely you should. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's great. So now that comes, br- bring us to the topic of um, the university. Can you tell us something about the university? a very brief introduction. Yes. So at Staffordshire University, we are located obviously in the city of Stoke-on-Trent. Um, for us, we're focused on providing students with a lot more practical degree programs that are going to help them really meet the demands of where the job market is going. So students do like to consider us as one of their options. Okay, that's great. I've read on the website you do have three different campuses. Can you let us know about where they are and what is the demographic and what type of students are there, a majority of the Pakistanis are in which campus Mm -hmm. and so on. Yeah, that's no problem. So for our university, we have our Stoke-on-Trent campus, which I mentioned a little bit earlier. And then we also have a London campus, which we call our Digital Institute. And that campus is actually where we teach some computing programs and some gaming programs. And we also have a Staffordshire campus, which does our uh, medical programs. And that would be nursing midwifery. Those programs are all also taught in the main campus. So depending on what students are looking for, if they want that community feel, they tend to pick the Stoke-on-Trent campus. But if they want to be working somewhere which matches a bit more like industry, then they pick the London campus. Um, both campuses, all three campuses actually are open to them depending on their, cho- uh, their area of study. Okay, that's great, that's great. So um, is there any preference as per you, uh, where would you prefer those international students to be coming and joining which campus first? Well, to be honest, there's no real preference. I think for any student out there, what you need to really be thinking about is all the opportunities that lie before you. So you're looking at the campus in terms of the facilities it has, the teams that they have in place to support you. Do they match up with your overall career goal? Um, You want to map out not just, you know, your academic journey, but also your social journey. You want to look at how you're going to network, how you're going to set yourself up to really utilize your graduate visa. So once you've researched all the different campuses, you start to figure out which one fits your needs the best. And then from there, it makes it a lot easier for you to transition into being in the UK. So when you say networking, so what type of networking do you think the students can do over there? When it comes to networking, students have a variety of options. So what we do at Stoke Campus is when students are joining in September and also at the beginning of the January term, we do provide opportunities to meet employers. So students can come there and start asking questions from the moment they arrive about what employers are looking for. And through those types of sessions, they also start to realize the skill sets they need to pick up and potentially the industries they need to do a bit more research into. And then in the UK, there's a lot of different groups and societies. So For example, I don't know if you guys have it, but there's an app called Meetup Mm -hmm. and there's loads of free events that would be running all across the country. And you'd be able to just say, oh, there's an event really close in Manchester or in Stoke and it's focused on computer scientists or it's focused in cybersecurity. Let me just go and start to socialize. And it gives a lot of leverage to the students because they socialize with different type of people. Same type of people as well, but then they explore a lot of other options as well. Exactly. It's really through the socialization that you're able to understand what people are looking for. And you don't realize through a lot of these conversations, you start to build relationships where someone can let you know, oh, my company has this coming up. Maybe you'd want to apply for it. And it makes you really comfortable. I think that's also why 
institutions are very focused on making sure students have strong English language. It's not for us, but it's more for you. The stronger your English is, the better you will feel networking and the more comfortable you feel and you'll actually feel um, happier being in the UK and studying abroad. So that's also a part of it. Okay, that's great. One thing, um, now since we're talking about language, mm-hmm. um, English is a necessity. It's it's the requirement, the vital thing to be studying anywhere in the world at, at this time. So I want to know for UK, especially for the university, what's the IELTS band that's required or what's the O-levels grade or A-levels grade that's required mm-hmm. for English? So universities such as us and other institutions, we accept a number of different English language tests. Mm-hmm. Um, for staffs, we're focused more on those secure language tests, the mm-hmm. SALT tests. So mm-hmm. you'd be looking at an IELTS. Most people are taking a language cert or a PTE, TOEFL. Mm-hmm. There's also exemptions available if you've come from an international curriculum. So someone who's done like IGCSEs, usually a grade C and above would be enough. Okay. For all IELTS, we ask for 6.0 overall, nothing below 5.5 for mm-hmm. undergraduate and masters. That will give you enough to be able to handle the assignments and to also integrate because as you go through your program your English level is always improving however we do also do um, we do also have English academic support so students can contact the team if they feel like they're not understanding their written assignments as well and they can keep improving Um, and what we've done the previous intake is we actually tested students before they arrived helped them identify weak areas and suggested to them classes they could take to help with improvement Okay, um, I want to know what about the job situation over there because many students, everybody wants to know how much they can earn, whether it's sustainable enough over there or not, whether they can stay back in the country after they complete their education and as a part-time, as a student, what mm-hmm. part-time jobs they can actually do. Okay, so I'll kind of give a little bit outline of the journey and then we can go backwards to talk about what you can do while you're studying. So most students are going to be utilizing the graduate visa after they complete their studies. So every student is eligible for it and it's a two-year post-study work visa that allows you to get employment in a company or at least some form of employment in order to bring your skill set up and then hopefully after um, you've completed your graduate visa your employer or someone will be able to sponsor you to stay after to to stay longer while you're studying while you're trying to build your skill set you have the ability to work 20 hours per week so that's part of the visa requirement itself Mm -hmm. and then students tend to work a little bit more than 20 hours during the vacation periods because again the primary purpose is to come to the uk to study so during the 20 hours a week the type of work you get will also depend on your city and also yourself and the type of opportunities you're um you know setting yourself up for i know students here at ice there's the incubation center so these guys are already freelancing and they're already trying to get themselves with um into the job market through remote jobs so your students for example would continue to do that they would have that ability or they can tra- start trying to see if there's um you know, evening type of work that's Mm -hmm. available, stuff that doesn't Mm -hmm. disrupt their studies. Mm -hmm. But day to day, there's always restaurant work. There's always, um, you know, supermarket work. There's warehouse work. There's all different types of industries. And security jobs, security guards, I know you've got a lot of them here in Pakistan. So it's a similar job there. And it's not as high risk in comparison to here as well. Okay, there were students who were asking me questions about uh, their freelancing work when Mm -hmm. the other day we conducted the session. So what they were asking is that, what if we are doing a, f- a part-time job over there, but we're also doing freelancing? Do we need any additional visa? Or it's fine. Or do we need to inform someone that we're doing freelancing? The government should know about it. As I don't know. far as I know, they don't need to inform anyone they're doing freelancing. Again, I think the only thing is that whatever they do, it shouldn't be disrupting their studies. Um, but if they have fine. already established a connection here, there's no reason why they would start that connection uh, once they've come to the UK. Okay, thank you. What about your stance on e-commerce, Amazon? Mm-hmm. So Amazon is very, very popular. I think it's getting very popular, in, you know, all across the West. So yes. students tend to either be doing some form of work for Amazon. There's loads of jobs. There's lots of warehouses in a number of locations. I know we have a few um, in and around Stoke-on-Trent. So students would be able to work there as well during uh, the vacation periods too. So up to how many hours they can work during the vacation period? Because everybody wants to earn money once they go there. I mean, typically during the vacation period, I know most students tend to work about 40 hours per week. It's a standard uh, work week. It's also manageable and it'll give them enough time uh, with their current employer. I think 
employers are always going to be looking at making sure students have a work-life balance so it may be a little bit different to hear however some students do potentially look at getting multiple jobs it all depends on the student themselves how about stores like tesco like when i was in malaysia i know for a fact as a student i could work there and earn money but it was not that much the hourly wages were not that high so how about in the uk Okay, so in the UK, the thing you'd want to think about when you're looking at hourly wages is there's a minimum wage always set out based on your age. So you can always find that from our government website, what the average minimum wage is. And then every employer for different jobs also sets their per hour wage. So you can have some which will be £10 an hour, some which may be seven, and some will go all the way up to £14. The employer dictates what the wage is and you would essentially be looking at what you need for your own circumstances as well. All right, so how about um, PGCE, post graduation Certificate in Education, since we're talking about jobs, uh, there are many um, mature audience who are teachers and who have done post-graduation certificate in education, especially since we are conducting sessions as ICE as well. Mm -hmm. So what do you think, what are the future um, job opportunities or the job pool in the UK for those teachers? I think. Teaching in the UK can be difficult. A portion of that is because a lot of uh, international audiences don't understand the UK education system. When you've done a PGCE or you've done anything equivalent to that, you can still get teaching opportunities. What you'd want to typically do is go on to those teaching websites. So um, even if you did a Google search, you'd be able to find them. So there's like eTeach, there's just gov.co.uk. It shows the different schemes and initiatives. So for example, currently, um, international teachers are able to, if they're teaching in English or, or some form of a language, as well as physics, they can potentially get a relocation package, which comes up to £10,000. There's obviously different eligibility criteria, but student, teachers can look at that. The main thing when you're thinking about teaching is trying to find open positions because you'd need to have your tier two visa in place an employer's going to sponsor you because being a teacher is obviously a skilled job. But they are international employers looking to sponsor students. I also think with the PGC, it's not just the UK that's open to you, it's also the rest of Europe. Definitely. And a lot of these teaching websites will list jobs everywhere. So not just in England, they'll do England, Scotland, Wales, all of them will also have different schemes in place. So that's where you want to find the individual scheme that fits you. So um, when we talk about minimum wages as per the age, is it also as is it also based on the location where they're working? Because I know London, for example, is a higher paying uh, destination for students. So something to always consider when you're looking at how much you're going to be paid and where you're located is it's also the cost of living so for example you can get a job that'll pay you the same um we're talking again being in those fields such as retail or in the service industry the job will pay you the same but the cost of living in order for you to get to work would be much lower outside of london so students do utilize london because there's a lot more opportunities um during the summer vacation period um they we run loads of sporting events etc so some students come down during that period and then go back up um because most international students will want to either return home during the summer vacation or they'll want to explore the UK, understand different cities. It'll it'll help you also decide if you want to stay long term um, for your graduate visa, which city you might be looking at applying. Mm -hmm. Because really, I would always recommend that you apply everywhere when you're in your graduate stage really? so that you get to get as many opportunities to possible. get experience. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. How about PhD or DBA? When students are doing that, do they have more um, acceptance rate in the UK? And if there's any credit transfer that the students can take? So PhDs for the UK, I would say some people feel it's really difficult process. It's not that there's just a standard application you complete. Each institution is going to be different. So it's important that you um, figure out which institution you definitely want to go to. In our case, what we actually prefer to do is we do ask students to first make an inquiry. We want to know and understand what they're looking to research. And then we um, speak to our academics to then see if there's someone who'd be willing to take the student on before they then apply. Um, but the normal process is in most institutions, you'd first contact a supervisor with yeah. your research proposal. Mm. So it's really important to have that research proposal mm. because it saves time 
in the constant backwards and forwards mm. and it allows you to make the intake you want to make as well because you don't want to get deferred to the next intake if mm. it's if you're thinking about funding etc so how many intakes are there at staff so for us we have three intakes for our phd oh that's great yeah so it's a january april and september intake okay and most institutions will have that you want to be at least making sure you've completed your application three months before the intake is due to happen mm-hmm. if you can do it earlier the better but three months before would give you enough time to at least get the, yeah, and everything. get the approval from mm. the academic team and then start your visa process as well okay and then um is it fully funded so i will be honest and say that getting a fully funded phd opportunity is not as easy mm. as um, students would like most universities will have more self-funded opportunities mm-hmm. all they so how you can find a funded opportunity is you'd go onto the university website you'd go into postgraduate research and they'll always show the postgraduate opportunities you'd click on that section and it'll show you all the different options for funding mm. what's available what the eligibility criteria is and then you can apply that way okay why do you think students should come to uk and not go to us or any other european country i think for us in the grand scheme of things when you do your overall research most students come because they know the quality of education it's well understood across the world but it's also a financial financially they're able to manage the cost um if you're able to pick the right location and you don't necessarily think just about london you'll be able to plan out a long term future for yourself as well so uh we've talked pretty much about everything but what i want to know in reality is how do we reach to the uk what's the visa process how does it work what's the timeline because all these things are basically um communicated to the students by a career placement officer or a consultant because we have a very rich culture of consultants over here educational mm-hmm. consultants or agents which you may call so how do they actually reach to the uk okay so for students you could actually um find this information for yourselves you don't just have to rely on um a second party or a third party depending on how you're finding your info so it's a pretty simple process first what they need to do is obviously have an offer from an institution that offer has to be unconditional which means that they 100% meet all the entry requirements and they're essentially ready to then accept their place accepting their place for most uk universities including us would be paying a deposit of a specified fee. So we ask our students to pay £6,500 which is just under half the tuition fee for one academic year. Then what they have to do is they have to show that they have the remaining tuition fee they haven't paid to us plus what the UK government asks as maintenance mm-hmm. in their bank account. Mm-hmm. So the government website does state that they want this funds in their account for 28 days consecutively from the date in which they apply for their visa. Mm-hmm. That's the normal process. Mm-hmm. So the calculation will change if they're studying inside London or outside London. So mm-hmm. that's also something to pay attention to. although the margins aren't that high um you're getting close to just over 9000 pounds if you're outside london and just over 10000 almost 11000 if, if you're, you're inside, inside london okay. yes and so, then the visa fees also on top of that yes, 6500 really visa have to fees pay. as well mm-hmm. so you also want to pay attention to that because you don't just pay for the visa application so currently if i'm not mistaken it's set at 490 pounds but that can change because no, it really, has it's 1035 pounds no, no, no. 490 pounds is a visa application fee okay. but then what they have is called the nhs surcharge okay. so when you study in the uk you also have to pay to access our healthcare system and that's really important because should you need to go to the doctor etc which is what you'd have to register for when you come to the when you enroll in your university you've already paid for that and you pay per year so it starts i want to say 755 pounds however it's all listed on the website quite clearly so it starts at that price and then what happens is per year so if you're doing a full 3 year degree mm-hmm. you'd have to pay that times 3 okay. if you're doing a degree that's 1 year you'd pay that on one time so there's a calculator on the system as well so all of these websites give you calculators to make sure you know how much to prepare and you'd put in the course you're doing when it starts when it ends where you're from and it will tell you exactly how much you need so to pay so which website can we look for this information so most of this stuff is going to be on the gov.co.uk website um for any of the study information how much you need for maintenance mm-hmm. you'd go on there and then you'd put into student visa section mm-hmm. and it talks about your eligibility and oh, all the different criteria that, that's that's going to make our life way more easier because <laughs> you see when anybody comes from 
especially from UK. And then we ask them the questions. They do tell what's the process, but they don't tell where to look information for. And there's so many websites out there. Oh, yeah. Even when I'll Google something up, UK visa, before I actually go to the original website, the government website, there are so many other websites of mm -hmm. agents coming up. They're clicking open, open, check your eligibility criteria, where to do this, do that, and then you pay a minimal fees and then you proceed with them. Yeah. But thank you so much for mentioning the website. It really, no. it's, I think it's really important for students and for audience, actually, not just students, but general audience to know where to look for the correct information. Yeah, and also a thing you should note is the universities are willing to share this with you. So if you go on our websites, there is a section that talks about the visa there's a section that talks about finances um you can read clearly and it also redirects you to those government websites so if you're unsure of starting first from the government website it may feel complex start from the university website and get yourself redirected so talking about the geography of the uk um you are more on the england side the the main campuses in mm -hmm. england so how does it differ like when you say like in the on the other day when i was when I saw you giving your presentation, you're like, oh, we are on the England side. So how does it differ? Because people are so confused. For the majority of the people, London is UK. That's yeah. it. Yes, yes. <laughs> I totally hear what you're saying. So this is something that we always try and st tell students to think about is that the United Kingdom is actually made up of multiple countries. So that's going to be Northern Ireland, England, Scotland, and Wales. Ireland is its own separate country and you don't wanna confuse that. So when we talk about we are on the England side, we're giving people a better idea about the type of funding they would get as there's different rules um, depending on which funding body you're applying for. There's also going to be different entry criteria. There's different years for programs. So for example, in Scotland, um, students can also study for four years instead of the normal three years. Um, also, they look at different qualifications because they want to match it to their education systems. However, everyone is doing A-levels, etc. So that's the best way to think about it. Um, what students tend to find is all the different countries also have slightly different weather and the population sizes are also very different. Oh. Obviously, most people pick England. However, Scotland is becoming very popular and so are portions of Wales. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, for us, we're in kind of the middle. We're called an area called the West Midlands, so the middle of England. And London is obviously where everyone wants, everyone to, study. wants to study. Yeah, exactly. which is our capital. That's the best way. Because again, all of those countries have their own capital cities. Oh, okay. So you've got to think about that because a capital city is obviously going to have a lot more companies, a lot more industry, and it's going to be luc more lucrative as well. Thank you so much, Babs, for coming to Pakistan and giving us your precious time at the podcast of Talk It Out. And I'm really hoping to have a good partnership in the future, especially for top of students, since you are here for that specifically at ICE. And then um, definitely we do have a lot of potential audience that you're looking for, your targeted audience from Pakistan in general. Students are very much interested in going to the UK. So thank you so much once again for being part of ICE, being part of Pakistan. Thank you so much for having me. And hopefully I answered some questions that you guys have been thinking oh, about completely. a little bit you did, you did that because <laughs> all the answers were right on point. Um, this is what our audience actually want to know rather than any university representative coming and talking about their university it's better to actually address the main problems that every student is going to be facing in the future when they'll go to the UK or they'll be looking for potential answers before they actually think of going to the UK. Yes, definitely. Just do your research, guys, whatever you do. Do your research. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you. Thank you once again. Thank you.